Okay, everybody, welcome to our talk on Game Changer at the London Chess Conference 2019. Uh, Game Changer is about Alpha Zero, and we're going to talk about, I'm going to introduce Alpha Zero to you. Um, I'm going to say how it got so good at chess, and actually why chess is so useful for AI researchers. And then Matthew is going to talk to you about what we've learned about chess. So he's going to say something about how AlphaZero plays chess um, and illustrate AlphaZero's style. OK, um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, this is Grandmaster Matthew Sadler. He is, what number in UK are you rated now? Uh, Changes on a daily basis. Two. Number two in the UK, um, and he has been in the top 20 in the world. Um, he's a very, very strong grandmaster. I'm Women's International Master Natasha Regan, um, and as well as chess, I can also play Go and Shogi, which are the other games that AlphaZero learned. So AlphaZero is a self-taught artificial intelligence. It was built by DeepMind. DeepMind is a UK artificial intelligence research company. So one of the leading artificial intelligence research organizations in the world, it's owned by Google. Um, and AlphaZero itself got to superhuman strength through teaching itself at all the games of chess, go and shogi. And it was uh, taught using a, a reinforcement algorithm. So it, it kind of played, just played a lot of games against itself and gradually got better. Alpha Zero defeated Stockfish, and Stockfish, you're probably lots of you are familiar with Stockfish, uh, the strongest traditional chess engine. And it was a thousand game match, um, and Alpha Zero won convincingly in that match. I think it lost only six games, won 155, and a whole load of draws. Um, and, and so for me, I was really, really fascinated um, that it had taught itself, and so would it play the same way as us? Uh, Matthew was very fascinated by the games themselves um, when they first came out and just the style that AlphaZero played. Very attacking, very brilliant, really nice for humans to watch. <coughs> so AlphaZero got to superhuman strength in just nine hours. Um, when it started playing chess, it played against itself completely at random. So it just played random moves against itself. And if you've ever tried teaching a small child to play chess, you'll, you'll realize that the games can just go on for ages and, and, and you don't make so much progress. Uh, but what it did was when it by chance happened to win a game, it tried to play a little bit more like that each time. Um, and because it played so many games, it was able to improve very quickly. So it played a lot of games, 44 million games to be precise against itself. Actually, AlphaZero didn't start off with chess. It started with a different game. I don't know, any of you familiar with, with this game here? A few, a few. It's the Oriental game of Go, which is also a mixture of tactics and strategy. Um, very interesting game. Um, and, and that's played a lot in Japan, Korea, and, um, and China. Um, and, and people say it's actually harder for... Um, computers to learn Go than chess, because actually with Go it's played on a very big board and there's a lot of choices for each move. There's more choices, so if you're just learning by calculating, if I go there, they go there, I go there, they go there, you, you quickly go to, you just can't calculate, there's too many possibilities. Uh, what Dem Demis actually, Demis Hesarbis, the CEO of DeepMind, actually is uh, plays Go and Chogi and chess, um, and he thought that the computers were, were trying to do it in the wrong way, approaching learning Go in the wrong way, and that um, they should be trying to understand the position a bit more, as well as doing all the calculations. Uh, so, so, actually, DeepMind started with AlphaGo, and there was a very big match. They, they, it got stronger and stronger, and in 2016, DeepMind challenged Lee Seedol, who is one of the greatest Go players of all time, to a match. It was a huge televised match. Um, and there is actually a film about it called Alpha Go, which is a really, really fascinating film. So if you get the chance to ever watch Alpha Go, I recommend you go out and watch it. Um, and it's, 
it's a bit like, like the experience of playing Go is just like playing chess. And it's a very emotional movie about a very strong Go player um, and how he is, for the first time, he was beaten by a computer at Go. Because the Go world wasn't expecting it at all. They were expecting the human to win. Um, OK, so after AlphaGo, then AlphaZero was created. Zero really means there's no human knowledge at all in there. Um, and AlphaZero taught itself how to play Go, beat AlphaGo 100 games to nil. Chess World Today. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with the chess world today. Um, there are nearly a million FIDE rated players from 185 countries. So, so loads of players play seriously and competitively. And then there's many, many more players who play chess just for fun. So it's a hugely popular game. Um, world champion, oh, I'm out of date now. I think he's, he's just turned 29, hasn't he? Um, the strongest women's player is here at this conference, and that's um, Judith Polgar. Um, and very active chess world. But the strongest players aren't humans at all. And so you get kind of two different types. We're showing two different types of um, computer systems. So one is the expert systems that rely on human knowledge in that uh, people have programmed in different positional factors. So there'd be like over 2,000 different positional factors that Stockfish might use, which might be the value of the pieces and the pawn structure, uh, various different things. Um, and then there's the completely self-learning systems. Um, and then we don't necessarily know exactly what rules they learn to make their moves. Um, but it's based on the structure of the human brain, uh, loosely based on the structure of the human brain and how we think. So it comes up with a very nice intuitive style of play. Why, why would we use games in order to do AI research? Um, games are very useful actually for a number of different reasons. Um, and one of the things is that you can actually do tests and, and see whether you're improving. So you can do, you can get more or less infinite data because you can just keep simulating more and more games. And then we've got a, a human rating scale so you can see that your computer is getting stronger and stronger. So with that feedback, you can then improve the way you are building your AI. And DeepMind haven't stopped at games. There's a number of different um, scientific applications that they are looking at. Um, and, and one of the ones is like protein folding, uh, because proteins can fold from very complex, very complex ways. And this kind of helps get a path through what might be a good way for scientists to research. So it's, it, it doesn't necessarily come up with the answer, but it shows scientists a way that they might be able to more quickly make progress. I'm going to now hopefully play a video. So if I go on here, then if I press. Yeah, that's an exciting move. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've seen an original move here. They said all is to go what Roger Federer is to tennis. Huge shock. Headlines around the world. 60 million people watched the game in China alone. For us, it's the culmination of a 20 year dream. Well, that was a huge moment. Well, okay, we've beaten the, uh, the world champion. How could we go further? I mean, what could we learn from that? There are so many possible application domains where creativity in a different dimension to what humans could do could be immensely valuable to us. And the search time is getting better and better, like as we go from, for example, one to eight, and anyone... There's been a big chain of events that followed on from all of the excitement of AlphaGo. <laughs> when we played against Lisa Doll, we actually had a system that had been trained on, on human data, on all of the millions of games that had been played by human experts. We eventually found a, a new algorithm, a much more elegant approach to the whole system, which actually stripped out all of the human knowledge and just started completely from scratch. Instead of learning from human data, it learned from its own games, and that became a project which we called AlphaZero. Zero meaning having zero human knowledge in the loop. AlphaZero is a kind of experiment in how little knowledge can we put into these systems and how quickly and how efficiently can they learn. 
The next stage was to make it more general so that it could play any two-player game, not just Go, but things like chess and shogi, which is Japanese chess, and in fact any kind of two-player perfect information game. What we discovered was that actually this exceeded all of our expectations. Alpha Zero could start in the morning playing completely randomly and then by tea it would be superhuman level, by dinner it would be the strongest chess entity there's ever been. After about eight or nine hours it was strong enough to be able to go out and defeat Stockfish, the incumbent world champion, a program which was vastly stronger than Deep Blue, the program which had previously defeated Kasparov. So I called up my longtime friend Matthew Sadler and Natasha Reagan, my two friends from when I used to play chess myself. So I knew that they would be very excited to come in and have a look at the system. And it did cause a big stir, actually, amongst the chess players. When I first started looking through the games, I started thinking, oh, it's quite interesting, quite interesting. And there's just a couple of games that went bang. These were very exciting games, very attacking games. I could see that Alpha Zero was trying something different. It's like this young kid from deepest Russia is sort of arriving and then suddenly beating everyone. It doesn't have an engine-like style. It plays like a, a human on fire. It can really try and evaluate things contextually in the moment. You know, right now, in this particular position, how valuable is my knight? Traditional chess engines like Stockfish basically consist of a huge database of rules. Alpha Zero doesn't have any rules. It learns through experience. And what I found so interesting was because it had taught itself, it might play the game in a completely different way from the way that we play it. It's like a check on everything that we've taught ourselves as humans since chess was devised, really. And it feels like it's got a lot of potential to do other things. <laughs> the next step is actually to see if we can go further. You know, we, we're trying to build general algorithms, not just to play chess, not just to play Go. The world's a messy place, and no one can exactly write down the rules by which it operates. We can work with energy systems in the real world, with healthcare systems in the real world. Where we'd like to go with this is to push onto new domains that no one's cracked, and actually use this approach to solve those. So I'm hoping in future that we and others will use Alpha Zero like techniques to help us make faster breakthroughs that I think society desperately needs. Okay. There we are, that's pretty good. Right, so that's, um, that's the story of, uh, of Alpha Zero, which is you know, quite amazing in itself, uh, just the idea that, uh, that um, you know, something can just learn from, from zero and become superhuman strength. Um, but the other part of it as well was, uh, apart from the amazing story behind it, the amazing scientific story, there's an amazing chess story behind it as well, because the games that AlphaZero played against Stockfish um, were quite amazing. They had some, uh, some quite amazing things in them. I mean, I, I first saw the games in, uh, in January 2018. You know, I, I got uh, taken to, uh, to a little room uh, somewhere in the DeepMind offices and uh, just got these 200 games and uh, said, yes, yes, go away to the people who were giving them to me and you know, just got my chessboard out and started playing through them. And um, actually, I started whizzing through them on, uh, on chess base, just uh, hand on fast forward button and off we go. And um, uh, I mean, after about uh, nine or ten games, something you know, very strange, something that I hadn't expected at all, you know, really became obvious to me. And that was that um, um, there was a consistent way of playing um, that I was able to discern just by starting to play through the games. You know, I could see that it was doing certain things quite regularly. Um, its rook's pawn was getting pushed quite a bit. It was always looking for opposite coloured bishops, bishops of different colours. And uh, so, you know, after those first 10 games, I started, uh, I stopped, I went back to the beginning and just started, you know, sorting out games into different themes. And soon I had about, you know, 20, 30 different themes, things that I could see Alpha Zero playing, you know, trying to do the same all the time. Um, and the other, you know, the amazing thing about it was that um, there were so many sacrifices, so many pawn sacrifices, pawn sacrifices that I couldn't really ascribe to any concrete tactical idea, you know, like I sacrifice a pawn and then I win. 
Um, but instead, it was um, sacrificing pawns for long-term play, stuff that I would say, well, if that's going to work, it's going to be in 20 or 30 moves. And indeed, that was the sort of thing that was happening. Um, and, uh, and that was completely, completely unexpected. And uh, that was, you know, still, I still remember it as a very emotional experience going through those games. You know, I was uh, there in that office laughing to myself and saying, my goodness, this Alpha Zero is a lunatic. That's seven pawns so far that have been sacrificed. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the funny thing about it is that um, um, the Deep Mind guys, uh, in general, I mean, Dennis is, uh, uh, plays every single game that you, that you know in human existence, but the other guys, uh, the technicians programming Alpha Zero, weren't games players at all. So uh, they came round afterwards, uh, the two technicians who'd given me the games, and said, well, you know, what do you think? I said, amazing, have you seen Bishop D4, Knight C5? I said, great, great, but I haven't a clue what you're talking about. You know, that's... Um, uh, so it's um, um, but really, you know, very amazing play. And there's um, just a couple of themes that, um, that really grabbed us. I mean, there's many different uh, uh, sub-themes, but there's a few things that really um, interested us uh, above anything else. First of all, this uh, mobility above material. Interesting thing about Alpha Zero, of course, it's had no human input in terms of um, strategy or values. So, for example, um, I mean, it's been taught the rules of chess, but it hasn't been told, is a knight worth three, a, a rook's worth uh, five, a pawn's worth one. It doesn't have that, that, it hasn't been told that material value. Actually, we don't even know whether it's got any sort of value for the pieces at all. Um, and um, what that seems to mean is that it's extremely flexible then in terms of giving up material, giving up pawns for long-term play, sacrificing the exchange. All these things happen well, very naturally, you could say, in its game. And um, what you notice as well is that um, if you try the same thing with traditional engines, um, well, they have, uh, their rules are you know, hard, always hard-coded to a certain extent. Um, the material value has been programmed in to some extent. So the compensation that it has to have for material sacrifice has to be big enough to overcome a bias in its, uh, in its programming towards material. If a rook is worth five, you need compensation maybe of five plus in order to be able to sacrifice that material um, uh, safely. If you don't have that idea that a rook is worth five, you'll probably think much easier, well, I can just give that rook away, the compensation is great. And um, um, that's really where, where you saw the difference in, um, in, especially in evaluations between um, Alpha Zero and Stockfish, that um, um, if you get a little bit deeper into the position, then Stockfish was often catching up, saying, yeah, okay, this compensation is now really serious. But by then it was often too late because the, uh, the, the, the horrific deed had already been done. Um, and, um, yeah, the key thing that you see about Alpha Zero's play, we'll have a look at a few examples, is mobility. The pieces have got to be able to move all over the place. And you see rooks being transferred from king side to center to queen side, back again. Enormous mobility of, uh, of the pieces. And something that, in principle, I know, yeah, I know, you know, I'm, uh, I know from my own games it should be possible, but it's pretty difficult to achieve in a game. And Alpha Zero manages this beautifully. This is one of, uh, of our favourite um, um, uh, games, all-time favourite games, actually. Maybe one of, certainly one of my all-time favourite games in chess. It's a game we called uh, Exactly How to Attack. We've given every game a, 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 a wonderful name. Um, and um, this one um, is uh, a position... Um, Alpha Zero is white, Stockfish is black. We're moving, obviously, from left to right. That's the, uh, the path of the game. Um, what you see on the right-hand side is that uh, actually Alpha Zero, very early on, move 13, 14, sacrificed two pawns on the G and H file. Um, and uh, um, there's no immediate mate at all, and it actually actively encouraged Stockfish to take its pawns. There's no mate at all. Um, just uh, the position looks generally promising for white, but ah, you're two pawns down. And um, when I was playing through the game, I really expected... Um, White's plan to be that the queen would get transferred to the G and H files and it would just keep on hammering with its major pieces on those open files. Um, in actual fact, um, yeah, that was completely the opposite to what Alpha Zero did. And it's one of those moments where you suddenly say, hey, wait a minute, I've, yeah, I've really understood something uh, all of a sudden. Because what Alpha Zero did was it wants to combine all of its pieces together in the attack. That's, uh, that's how um, uh, somehow Alpha Zero seems to have a, a wonderful sense for combining pieces in an attack. And what it actually tried to do was to involve both its bishops in the attack as well. Um, and in particular, that bishop on b2. 
And uh, in order to activate that dark squared bishop, um, actually you have to clear the, 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 the center of pawns. So actually its next uh, few moves um, were actually all about getting in uh, a number of central breaks and actually getting rid of its central pawns. Once that uh, happened, you end up in, in the position on move 35. And what's quite bizarre is that you've sacrificed early on two pawns on the king side, and yet somehow you've now centralized your pieces. They're all conglomerated in the center, the queen, the dark squared bishop, the two rooks, the, bishop, the light squared bishop, actually all pointing very centrally. And bizarrely enough, there's a number of variations, uh, sub-variations, you know, if black had done certain things, where actually the decision comes on the queen side. There's some uh, amazing bishop a6 variation, which we show in the book, that, uh, where the, um, which, uh, which, which finishes things off. And then at the end of the game, um, once alpha zero has managed to get the center free, get that dark squared bishop, its bishops pointing towards the king, everything switches back to the king side. And you suddenly see in the last position on the right, bishops are pointing towards the king, bishop on b2, bishop on b1. Um, the rooks are um, in a, well, slightly exotic position. You can say certainly that rook on d6, but it's pointing towards the, uh, the king's side along the rank. And uh, the final thing that Alpha Zero did was somehow it sacrificed, it offered seven pawn sacrifices in total during the game, but that pawn on f4, the last pawn on the king's side, that was the key because that's going to f5 to break open the, uh, the, the black king's side. And um, um, that's actually one of the games that really um, showed, well, both the, the Alpha Zero skill and also, you know, what, is, what can it do better than uh, the traditional engines with their enormous calculating power and enormous search depth and, you know, enormous inbuilt knowledge. And it was simply um, understanding that the position on the left-hand side offers enormous amounts of um, long-term play and possibilities for improving your position. Um, and um, uh, it's not that Alpha Zero assessed this left-hand position as winning. It was 55% expected score. So it thought, uh, you know, out of 10 games, score five and a half out of 10. You can uh, look at it that way. But, um, um, but that was very different to Stockfish's evaluation, which was saying, you know, uh, it thought it was one pawn up or close to that. Um, and then by the time of, uh, of move 35, you know, it's, Alpha Zero already thinks it's completely won. There's no chance whatsoever. So it's um, very interesting to see that, to see the evaluations move after move and to try and, uh, and, to, and, and to see what the difference is between uh, you know, an amazingly strong traditional engine with uh, amazing defensive strength and what Alpha Zero managed to do to it in these types of positions. And um, we've talked about mobility of its own position, uh, mobility of its own pieces, the, you know, the, 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 the pendant to that is, um, is that um, um, it's also looking to restrict the activity of, uh, of the opponent's pieces. I mean, Natasha did some very interesting uh, statistical work on um, mobility of the king. That was one of the things we looked at. And we sort of saw that um, in uh, many of the games that uh, Alpha Zero was playing against Stockfish, um, uh, Alpha Zero's king always had many more moves uh, that it could go to, whereas uh, Stockfish's king was getting restricted. And one of the things Alpha Zero does uh, very early is to often move its rook's pawn very early up to a square like h6, if you can see that on the board, right close to the opponent's king, which introduces checkmate ideas, pins the opponent's king to the back rank, um, and also is pretty useful in endgames as well. And it's just a long-term thought, just that long-term thought of this will be useful in many different positions in the game. There's no specific one that you're doing at that point, it's just useful. And um, that is actually one of the themes that um, if you look at um, the top players and you look at uh, particular games of Magnus Carlsen, you see that's one theme that's really come to the fore in, uh, in Grandmaster Chess in, uh, since Alpha Zero's games have become known. Um, this is a, another um, example of, um, of what was happening to, uh, to Stockfish in games, that it, uh, in games that it lost. If you look at, again, it's um, Alpha Zero white, Stockfish black, and looking at the position um, moving from left to right, um, and uh, it's sort of snapshots, you know, over, over a period of about 36 moves. And um, somehow what, what happens in this position is that Alpha Zero manages to encroach gradually. Gradually the, uh, the pieces come closer and closer to the opponent's position, and somehow Stockfish never quite manages to get its own play going on the queen side. And they're always very specific, you know, there's always uh, reasons why, well, it probably needs to make another defensive move here, but somehow it never gets going. 
And, um, but there was one very interesting moment because um, uh, you know, I play a lot of practice games against stockfish. That's, I'm not a chess professional, so one of the ways uh, that, I, uh, that I train is uh, every day a 15-minute game against stockfish, get beaten, try and learn from it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and um, uh, thankfully, my, uh, my score is actually... Uh, uh, I've decided that my score is covered by a, by a non-disclosure agreement, so uh, I won't actually tell you what I'm scoring, but... Um, the, the, the amazing thing is that this type of position, um, especially the position, uh, the second type of position, that's one I actually have, type of position I have reasonably often against stockfish. Um, you know, I play, um, often try a king's Indian attack against it, if, uh, if that uh, means something to you, and uh, you often get these types of structures. And this way of that stockfish is defended, it puts its rook behind the king, uh, then moves its king back, because it's, it sees that white's actually planning to open up the h-file. You know, that's white's plan, white's going to play g5, the h-file is going to be opened, and then that rook's going to be in a great place. And, um, well, I mean, normally, you know, I just uh, keep on going, open the h-file, and then get mated on the h-file afterwards, you know, just after, uh, after, after about uh, 20 or 30 moves, and say, darn it, it's gone wrong again. What you notice with, uh, with Alpha Zero is that, um, well, it was teeing up for a kingside attack, you know, with uh, g4, g5, but then when it saw that, um, that um, Stockfish had put its pieces actually quite passively, you know, awaiting something being opened, it changed its plan completely. So actually the, the whole plan became not a kingside attack, but actually exploiting the passivity of that rook in the corner. So it didn't open the H file, it went for a different pawn break, you see the F pawn uh, coming up there. Um, and what it also tried to do, you see on the other side, it just tried to exchange all of Black's other active pieces. So everything on the queen side gets exchanged, that rook gets exchanged, and then on the right-hand side what you see, what is Black left with, what is Stockfish left with? It's left with this absolutely appalling rook on h8, which can never get out because the king can't move either, and, um, well, there's just this, uh, these nice open files on the queen side through which White can then invade. So actually the files that Stockfish was kind of trying to open to, uh, to get its own counterplay, they end up being the key to Alpha Zero just invading and winning. And this sort of um, flexibility in planning, again, this is something that you, uh, you, you, know, you associate with, with some of the great human players, like Karpov or someone like this, this beautiful flexibility that you've, you're, you're doing a plan, then you react according to the details and the position, you say, okay, well, we'll do a completely different plan, we're going to try going on the, on the other side of the board. And, um, um, of course, you know, great human players, you get some great games where human players have done it, but, of course, Alpha Zero is a machine, it's never tired, it's never had a bad night's sleep, never lacking coffee, so it's always able to, um, uh, to, you know, to play at this level. And, uh, I mean, certainly, in, you know, I've seen thousands of Alpha Zero games uh, against Stockfish, and the, you know, the quality and the, um, the uh, um, just the, the, sh the, the, sh the sheer amazing chess that you see in, uh, in so, you know, in so many of those games is, uh, is amazing to behold. Um, of course, you know, one of the things I think you do have to say about it is that I think the reason that those games are so great is that you've got this wonderful clash of styles because uh, you've got Stockfish, which is calculating unbelievably deeply, amazing defender, uh, definitely the, uh, the engine that you'd want to, to, uh, to go to if you're hanging on the edge of a precipice uh, by, your, by your fingernails and uh, a machine has to defend a position for you to survive. I mean, that's, uh, that's the thing that it does well. And then Alpha Zero, which has got this beautiful, um, well, you say intuitive uh, feel to it, that um, simply complex strategical positions, unbalanced material, um, just got this amazing sense of how to improve its position continually. It's always finding new paths, new avenues. And um, um, in actual fact, you know, one of the uh, favorite uh, pastimes of, um, um, of uh, chess players nowadays, professional chess players or anyone serious about preparation, is to get interesting positions and then get uh, Leela, zero, open source, uh, re-implementation of, uh, of DeepMind's paper, uh, get it to play against Stockfish, you know, match of 40 games, and then just see the fireworks that happen. You know, and then that's an amazing way to get uh, a huge amount of depth and understanding about positions. So I, I, um, a very strong uh, chess player told me that, uh, that that was his holiday, in actual fact. Uh, two weeks watching, uh, you know, I think maybe his wife was on the beach or something, and uh, kids as well, and he was just watching Leela play, uh, play Stockfish in all these games. I quite agree, actually, by the way. I think that's, that's a very good use of holiday. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, our book Game Changer um, was uh, simply came 
came out of you know, our enthusiasm for the, for the whole AlphaZero story. So you know, what Natasha uh, said about uh, the way that it's put together and uh, you know, the way that it learned just seems you know, amazing when you think about it. And also, of course, the fact that um, the games are fantastic, but also the games are very thematic. So you can really, you really understand, you can really see big themes taking, part in, taking shape in the game and being carried out. And, um, well, you know, we discussed this with Demis, and Demis, you know, made this incredibly good point that, you know, for humans, um, it's very hard to learn anything from, uh, from Stockfish because it's, in, in the basis, it's so tactical. You know, there's, there's very specific lines that make sure that make Stockfish's uh, moves work. But when there's stuff that's strategical in nature, you know, in which big ideas, big themes, those are things that we can actually learn from and we can actually apply in our own games. And, um, well, that's why we actually also decided from the chess point of view to organise Game Changer thematically around the themes that we detected in games. And, uh, well, there's many, March of the Rook Pawn, Opposite Coloured Bishops, uh, Sacrifices for Time, Space and Damage, wonderful chapters. Definitely recommend them. Right, so this is um, um, our, best, our very best uh, book review, um, which was... Uh, um, at our, we're going to start it from about one minute. So, um, so this was um, taken. This was uh, at the Tata Steel tournament where we um, um, where we actually uh, did our book presentation. And I'll, I'll start it just in a moment. Yeah. And um, um, I don't know if, if anyone, any of you have been to Vikanze. It's a huge tournament in Holland, uh, a little bit like the uh, the Wimbledon of uh, of chess, you could say. Um, but it is a real hardcore chess experience. It's uh, a Dutch um, coastal town in winter, uh, minus 20, nothing to do there except chess, chess, chess. If you go out of your hotel, you see people, you see chess players. If you go into a cafe, chess boards all around. It's, um, so, um, uh, yeah, it's quite a, an, an all-in chess experience. That much, I have a game, a game tomorrow uh, and, um, and just the day after that. And that that's what I focus on. Yesterday was a rest day. On the previous rest day, you published a video on the Instagram account running into the sea. Did you do anything as crazy yesterday to celebrate that victory over Nan? I don't think it's it's crazy. We're we're at the sea. Uh, going uh, into the sea should be a normal. Uh, no, I yesterday I just I played a bit of football and that was it. The final question today, uh, the book Game Changer by Matthew Sadler and Natasha Regan is being presented here uh, in Vikansee. Did you look at the games uh, which were released by Alpha Zero and what is your opinion on it? Uh, well, I, I uh, skimmed through the book yesterday and uh, I, yeah, I, it was quite inspirational and uh, I was thinking at several points during the game, how would Alpha Zero have approached this? But uh, and then I, I mean, I, I thought Alpha Zero would have played F5, F4, and then very slowly tried to go G6, H5, and then I realized I'm not Alpha Zero, and I made the draw. How close do you think you can get to being Alpha Zero? <laughs> not very close. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts, and best of luck for tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, we'll carry on. With Yeah, that's. Um, uh, I always remember with with Magnus because um, I, I retired from professional chess, you know, before Magnus got uh, got strong. But the very first words he said to me was at another at another tournament, in actual fact, uh, that um, where um, um, I played in a in a subsection under under his, and I hadn't played very well. So his very first words that he ever spoke to me were. My goodness, you play crap. So, um, so he's, he's a guy who sort of tells you uh, tells you what he thinks, really. Uh, but um, it, it's um, uh, but we, uh, we we were we were walking in uh, in Vikanze, uh, just uh, after the book presentation. Came across from the corridor. He said, "Hey, nice book." So we were very happy with that. It's um, um, yeah, it's an interesting um, uh, thing. Um, you know, what can we learn from um, from AI? What can we learn from from um, from Alpha Zero for playing chess? And, um, well, I mean, our contention is that these games are so thematic, so strategical, that you really can apply a lot of these things in your own game. At the very least, um, you've got a number of new tools in your, in your chess toolbox. You can say, you know, um, these positions with opposite-coloured bishops, I thought they were drawn before, but somehow 
and uh, now I believe in the power of their attack, you know, stuff like that. And one nice thing, we had um, um, a guy, uh, a Dutch guy, I, I used to live in Holland, so I know the Dutch chess scene quite well, and um, he wrote a, a lovely blog article, he's about, uh, he's about uh, 1900, 2000 strength play, he wrote a lovely blog article about um, how he'd um, read through our book, he'd read um, a, a wonderful game called Rook's Pawn Symphony, um, where the Alpha Zero's two, two Rook's Pawn charge down and completely encircle the opponent's position. Wonderful game. We've done a video on it uh, recently on our, on our YouTube channel. And um, um, he'd seen the game and he said, oh, that's actually uh, an opening that I play. And that very same evening, he actually managed to play a game that incorporated all the major themes from that game. So he managed to put, uh, he, he, uh, he moved his, uh, his rook's pawn, one rook's pawn forward, moved his king to the side, opened the king side with a G file, used his A pawn as a decoy, and uh, he said that it was amazing. I felt like I was part of something greater whilst I was uh, doing it. But it really made us think that, um, yeah, I mean, I do think we are, you know, we're, we're completely right in what we say, that uh, these big strategical themes, there's really stuff that you can think about, use in your game and try out. And um, certainly I, I found that, you know, after, since working on, um, on Alpha Zero's uh, um, games, that uh, an awful lot of things that I think about during the game are influenced by that. Um, um, you know, certainly in terms of when I'm attacking, defending, and that sort of thing. And I think, um, you know, also there's, um, what's been very nice is that, um, 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 I mean, I guess, you know, when you're looking at, um, at 1997, I, you know, Deep Blue against Kasparov, you saw that uh, that kind of died, basically, after, um, after uh, Gary lost the game. IBM kind of lost interest, and, um, and, and that was it. But, um, well, DeepMind released uh, the science in their scientific paper for um, um, in a huge scientific uh, magazine and uh, released the science, and then people have taken that, and the open source community has gone running with that. And now, because of that, we've got Leela Zero and also a number of other engines like Ali Stein and, uh, and Stoflace and, uh, and others. Again, superhuman strength and available to everyone. You can run them on your own PC. And I think what we've seen there is that now, you know, grandmasters have been able to use those machines uh, to prepare, like, uh, like I prepare, playing mini matches, uh, leaders here against Stockfish, and I think you've seen a huge number of new ideas coming into uh, opening theory uh, because of that. Um, and, uh, well, certainly early advance of the Rook's Pawn to H6 or to H3 has become just a, a real, um, well, it's a standard theme nowadays in, uh, in, um, uh, in chess. I mean, uh, Ding Loren was interviewed recently, he finished his game against Rajabov with a, a pawn on H6 and then went around exchanging other pieces. He said, yeah, 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 Alpha Zero theme. You know, it's that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, well, there we are. I think that's going to be, uh, conclude our presentation. I mean, I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this look at, um, at uh, um, Alpha Zero, um, at, at the chess. Hope you've got that enthusiasm that we feel for, um, um, for um, both the, the science and the chess. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, uh, if, uh, if you're particularly keen, then you can definitely buy one of our books. Uh, Game Changer is, uh, is out there. And, um, um, and otherwise, you can uh, follow our YouTube channel. Um, we had um, so much amazing material that we couldn't, uh, even with all the material that we put in, you know, the book was 400 pages long. So on our YouTube channel, Game Changer Chess, there's about, there's a moment and counting, there's about 15 or 16 extra games that, uh, well, we analyzed but didn't put into the book. So that's a nice uh, bonus as well. So there we are, I think I conclude that, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Natasha and Matthew, for that absolutely uh, extraordinary um, account of the development of the book and uh, how you um, went about it. So I'd like to invite questions from the floor now. Uh, I'm sure uh, um, everybody's got questions, yes? Oh, several hands have gone up. Um, I, okay, I, I'll start off with uh, Vince here. first. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, disclaimer, I'm one of the Stockfish developers, so <laughs> um, I'm glad we can provide so much entertainment, even if it's just being a cybernetic punching bag these days for the, for the AI engines. Um, but my question, uh, well, to both Matthew and Natasha, because you've obviously both played and enjoyed the games, to turn it on its head, did you actually find it heartening to see that Alpha Zero style showed how much humans had got right? in how chess had developed, because 
in John Watson's book, The Secrets of Modern Chess Strategy, from a, a sort of decade and a half ago, there's definitely a, 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 an undercurrent of saying that the stock, what Stockfish exemplified was the truth, that chess was really just all concrete and the search for grand themes uh, uh, and overarching themes was actually fruitless and that was where it was going to go. And now, having deployed a new technology, we found that actually chess was even more beautiful and more thematic and, in a sense, the ultimate chess player, if that's what uh, Alpha Zero represents, is like Paul Morphy meets the Terminator with a little squeeze of Petrosian on top. Yeah, definitely. And um, the, the games couldn't possibly have been as good quality and as instructive without both Alpha Zero and Stockfish to provide that entertainment. Um, yeah, we were amazed at how close to human uh, that some of this play was. So, for example, in the opening theory, um, Alpha Zero separately discovered the Berlin defense. Um, there were lots of human openings, and actually quite a lot of the games went straight down openings that were, were widely played by top grandmasters. Quite a lot of the time, Alpha Zero and Stockfish would like the same moves in a, in a particular position. Um, and other times, but other times very different. And, and so it was, it was really nice that there were themes that humans had discovered, and, and sometimes Alpha Zero would, would take an, an extra step or discover a new element within those themes, or also how separate themes work together, and that, so what conditions you need, like this bit with a, a rook on an open line and a bishop on a diagonal, bring the knight in. And when you've got all those things that combine together, then that leads to a really, really powerful attack. So, so it, was, it was a mixture of things that are very the same uh, for humans, uh, so Alpha Zero compared with humans, compared with stockfish, and things that are different. And, and throughout, we, we've always been saying that um, it, to, to get the most out of your engine, then look at both. So look at uh, the traditional engines, look at the neural nets, because they have different strengths and weaknesses, and, so, and, and also it creates this, this contrast in style. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think we're still, uh, we're still searching for, the, uh, for, for, for absolute perfection in chess, but at the moment, we've got representatives from both sides, and uh, when they play together, you know, that's, that's when you're really learning, I think, the ultimate truth about chess. Oh, thank you um, for that absolutely comprehensive answer. I, I didn't realise we had uh, Stockfish versus Alpha Zero debate going on in the well, actually, conference. Actually, yeah, we, we gave a, a talk recently where taught, with Tort Romstadt as well. So, uh, in, uh, so we had a nice, uh, a good chat with him. Tort Romstadt is the original guy behind uh, behind Stockfish, and uh, yeah, that was very. We also played shogi with him as well. So uh, that was uh, that was also very good. Uh, Jason, thanks very chat. much. Uh, first of all, a, a wonderful presentation, lots of wonderful energy and enthusiasm. Thanks very much for sharing that. Um, I'm looking for uh, an idea when you were discussing the compensation, the algorithm between materialism, the material you give up, and the mobility of pieces. Could there be a parallel in music with the, the space between the notes being as important as the notes themselves, the space between the moves, the fighting the space can be as important as acquiring the material, this concept of space? That's, 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 very, that's very, very interesting. I'm a, my, my brother's a concert pianist, so I'm I've, I've, I've really, uh, really into uh, huge into music. Now, that's a, that's a very interesting concept. I mean, the, um, funnily enough, dis discussing, uh, discussing with a, 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 another player about, um, um, yeah, how, how does that work with King Mobility, for, for King Mobility, for example, with Alpha Zero? I mean, it seems to, to want to have space around its king all the time, uh, to have you know, both escape squares and also, um, yeah, space where... Um, yeah, in order to, yeah, I guess in order to escape, you know, we were trying to work out exactly, you know, how could we express that in a, in a human way? But I love this, uh, I love this idea of, uh, just like, you know, the, uh, the, the space between notes, the, 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 the time that there's no, yeah. And that might be a lovely way to, uh, to explain it. Uh, um, but certainly what, what we do notice, I mean, yeah, you know, mentioning Natasha's, what, what Natasha did with her, with her analysis again, we, uh, we did notice that, you know, space around the king, the king's ability to move was a, was a very key uh, part of, um, of, of Alpha Zero's play, and uh, the, the places where it found safety for its king was, was quite unusual. You know, that's uh, oh, it's a beautiful, uh, really beautiful uh, comparison. I'll have to think about that, but thank you. Yes, uh, Pep Suarez. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, Matthews, um, really a fantastic book. I think it is, I told you before, I think it is the best book for the last 10 years, sure. Sure. Um, my question is, how 
how the trainer, like me, the trainer that I'm working with, very strong player, how much changing because after this new revolution, all that we doing before, I thinking we must change him. We must change in our uh, structure, our mind structure. When I teach an international master, I, street, I teach in, uh, my students, uh, before read your book, <laughs> I do it like Bareski uh, this to me, Yusuf, Bareski, Michal Hishin, everyone, no? But after uh, read your book, I change my mind. Okay. I now, I understand that something that before I don't have in my mind, I, a pound, a pound, one colon and a one diagonal is so easy, you know. How we can take advantage of this knowledge, this new knowledge, because I think it is uh, radical uh, changing. Thank you very much. Another time, congratulations to both. Did you do it? Oh, yeah. well, um, one thing, one thing that um, I was showing to a group of kids, which they did, they did find really quite intuitive, which I hadn't previously thought was an easy theme, which is, um, it came from one of the very first Alpha Zero games. So, you know, there were 10 Alpha Zero games published first. And you might, some of you might remember this amazing game where white suddenly goes queen h1 into the corner. Um, and it looks like the strangest move because white's sacrificed, gone into this crazy attack, and then suddenly brings this piece back. And the purpose of the move was actually because black's pieces were still, some of them were still on their starting squares. And what was try, White was trying to do, and it's similar to the one Matthew showed with the rook stuck in the corner, is that when the pieces were stuck, then to swap off pieces, and even though your material down overall, in terms of the pieces you've got that are actually in play, you've got an advantage because you're swapping off all those active pieces. So you, you end up with one or two active pieces against zero, um, and that way you can, you can do your attack. And, and I found that one of the themes um, that I've also been able to use in my own play and that kids kind of do understand and they can kind of predict the moves. Uh, so that, and also the, um, the h pawn pushing and also not being afraid of giving up material. I think uh, kids can really relate to, to those kind of games and they really enjoy them. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, how I look at Alpha Zero actually is, um, uh, well, we sort of joked that uh, what we were doing was writing a biography of a player, but not a biography of the past, but a biography of a player of the future. And um, um, how I've, you know, um, at many times during my chess career, I've looked, I've spent, you know, weeks looking through Capablanca's games or Alakin's games. Uh, I've even, even tried with Stockfish's games as well, uh, specifically on defence, actually, to try and learn how does Stockfish defend and how, how can we possibly do that. There's quite a big chapter in the book on defence and, well, use some of that work that I did uh, a number of years ago. Um, but um, um, and what I noticed, you know, when you go, when you spend uh, that amount of time immersing yourself in the games of a great player, is that when it comes to your games, um, you suddenly at certain points in, in time you'll say, "Oh, God, I can play a Capablanca move, or I can play like Alakin." And I tell you, that feels so much better than saying, "I'm going to play like Sadler." If you can just say, "I'm going to play like Alakin," <laughs> and um, uh, and to be honest, you know, that is more or less what you can learn from, um, from Alpha Zero. It's simply, you know, when you've spent quite a lot of time looking at Alpha Zero games, you suddenly start saying, oh, I can play an Alpha Zero type move there. You know, and, uh, and, uh, um, and yeah, somehow, you know, the, the games that it produces with Stockfisher lend themselves quite easily to picking out those sort, of, um, those sort of themes and then being able to apply them in your own game. But I think it's, you know, what has been said earlier is that a lot of it, um, you really do see that um, stuff that we understood about the center, all those basic concepts, they remain the same. But I think we've got some beautiful, evocative demonstrations of how you can use a number of themes. You know, and, uh, and I, think that's, I think the basics are still exactly the same. I don't think uh, the Alpha Zero has changed any of that. But uh, there's a, f a, f a number of new tools in your toolbox that you can use and apply. And, uh, and you've got some wonderfully evocative games you know, to give you that, that little, um, that little ment memory stimulus that you can actually remember them in your own games. So, uh, yeah. Well, absolutely uh, comprehensive uh, answers from our two sparkling speakers. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to draw to a close the, um, the, the question and answer session here. Um, so, um, uh, but before they leave, I'd like to point out their books are still a few left in their bag and uh, you, you want to make their journey lighter going home, I'm sure. So um, perhaps you can grab them on their, on their way out if you, if you wish. Um, a 
probably also take this opportunity to announce that, that I think that the, the theme for next year's conference will be chess and artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you very much. Round of applause.